So, <clears throat> shall I fire it up? Oh, welcome everyone to our, I believe, 10th virtual bridge session. Um, <laughs> and, and we have a full room. Ah, as long as we're maintaining social distancing rules, then all should be good. But I'm delighted to welcome John Casey, who is live streaming, apparently, from his camper van. <laughs> and where, where, where is that, John? That is North Berwick. North Berwick, okay. Well, you've got a remarkably good reception from North Berwick. Absolutely. And uh, I, I'm just looking at the weather report now. It's supposed to be raining there. Why is it, why is it such a blue sky? Yeah, time travel. <laughs> okay, so handing over to John Casey, um, who is writing a book that I desperately want to buy. And I desperately want to hear the 12 tips that are held within that. So over to you, John. Thanks, Kenji. Um, that book is like the slow cooking movement. It's going slow. <laughs> right, so one, you go share screen. Here we go, desktop. Share. Right. Um, uh, here we go. So it's, it's now 13 plus ed tech tips for life. Um, so I'll just talk through this in my uh, gentle way. And if anyone wants to stop me they'll have to shout to Kenji so like Kenji says this is uh, a book that I'm very slowly writing it's more about if you like the sociological ethnographic aspects of educational technology if I can put it that way so <clears throat> this is a rough content list uh, to see ourselves student IT skills content don't do it is my <laughs> My, my advice, something about copyright. The Addy model, which for some reason is not very popular in the UK in HE and FE. The KISS principle, Vikings, Pirates and Outlaws, frugal design, open content, the Prince of Ed Tech, a bit about politics. Well, actually, it's mostly about politics. Analysis, readings and resource lists, a bit more about politics and some bonus slides. So I'll just carry on. He said he was going to carry on. Oh, that's better. Yeah. So I'm not going to misquote the immortal bad, but to see ourselves as others see us is a great gift. So I'm just thinking, what does our offer to students look like? Is it like the picture of the scooter? a mod, all form and no substance, or is it stripped down and simple, according to the lines of the KISS engineering principle? And I tend to veer to the KISS principle rather than the mod principle. Um, if our ed tech activities have got every imaginable add-on, is it really effective? So a little comment about student IT skills. It's a very common myth that they've got great IT skills. Um, in my experience, being good at PlayStation and your mobile phone isn't the same as being able to work through a pretty clunky VLE or even an IT system when they go into work. So typically, most of the students will not know about file management, information management, renaming files. So design accordingly. This uh, graphic on its side is uh, about increasing entropy when a student gets into our systems. It gets more chaotic as they work their way through. So yeah, content. Um, it's like a nervous tick that academics have got that they have to create their own content. Um, it would be really good if they didn't and just concentrated on teaching. Um, and actually, this comment from Ramsden, who, if you've not come across his work, is such a good, good writer. He's passed away, unfortunately, but he's, he's a classic. And he's got three stages of teaching development there. Um, just delivering content, organising activity, and then being able to adapt your teaching in the light of feedback. Copyright and contractors, my old friend, intellectual property rights. <coughs> When you do create content, keep a list of third party content. Just for clarity, third party content is anything that you have not created. I know it's a drag, but you should do it, especially if you're going open. Um, contractors, um, for anyone from outside your institution, 
get an assignment of IPR intellectual property rights and all the editable high definition content and code, etc. Get that agreement done before you, you give them all your money. I've seen this so many times, it's not true. It is a waste of money not doing that. There's a link there to a little uh, guide that I did in the past. Um, oh yeah, <clears throat> ADI, the Instructional Design Systems Model. It stands for Analysis, Design, Develop, Implement and Evaluate. And it's really weird that it's not used more widely in FE and HE. It is used in the defence sector, and it is used in industry quite a lot, but in FE and HE, it just doesn't seem to be used. And I know our colleagues in educational development actually don't like it because of its sort of supposed links to um, behaviorism, but it's, it's way beyond that where it was like in the 50s. So I would really recommend looking at that. Um, and the good thing about it, it's a procedural model. It's not a conceptual model. And what I mean is Bloom's taxonomy, SAMIR, TPAC, and all the rest of it. These are useful conceptual models, but they're not a procedural model to get you from the beginning to the end of a course development process. And I strongly recommend uh, Dan Laurelite's book there, uh, Teaching as a Design Science. It's very good. And actually, if you combine that with the ABC Learning Design uh, Toolkit, you're, you're in a good place. But the ABC Learning Design Toolkit He's only given you the first D of Addy. You need to remember that. Okay, keep it simple. A good engineering principle. Um, look it up in Wikipedia. I, I love it. So I don't use tech for the sake of it. Innovative and disruptive are common phrases in our world. Um, really? Is what I have to say. What about effective, easy and sustainable? Um, less really is more in my humble opinion. Oh yes, Vikings, pirates and outlaws. Um, I love the etymology of these words. Um, and this is really to reflect a, a common thing I've seen in my working life of academics walking away from our institutional systems and operating outside. Our organisations have always been porous, if you like, to the outside world. But some intrepid souls seem to go beyond the borders altogether. <coughs> so to leave home on an expedition, to make an attempt or an endeavour, or to live beyond the law. I do have some interesting examples for this. Um, once when I was working at UHI many years ago, we were working with three separate uh, virtual learning environments. Uh, and one of the responses to that by some academics was to just use email. And it worked nice and simple. Um, another example is, uh, an art college I worked in London, an entire course, including pirated PDF copies of textbooks, was hosted on an external WordPress site. And what's interesting about this is how academics will kind of gravitate to what works for them, regardless of what an institution tells them to do. It's a persistent trend in my experience. I'm not dobbing anyone here in, by the way, this is all semi-anonymous. Oh yeah, if you can come across it, A General History of the Pirates is a good read. Um, love that book. Yeah, so frugal design. You can tell I'm on a, a mission here to keep things simple. It's uh, associated with the developing world, uh, but I think it's got a lot of applications in the developed world. We are drowning in resources in HE and FE, but for various reasons, they're not easily used or available. So there's a lot to be said the frugal design principles. And yeah, like I say here, it's a useful response to chaos and complexity in our institutions. <clears throat> open education, well, I love open education and, and its potentials, um, but it's not used much in our institutions um, because our institutions are what I would call gated communities. They're closed, uh, inward looking. In many cases authoritarian still. Uh, and the concept of open education and making your stuff open is still deeply transgressive in further education and higher education. And I love that word transgressive. It sums it up. But introducing uh, open education can be a useful way of driving cultural change in an institution. 
It's weird, but it's often easier for a colleague to share their stuff with the world rather than someone down the corridor that they don't like. So as a, an argument for cultural change in our institutions, I would argue it's underused at the moment. A bit more on politics. Um, I used to read this book by Anthony Sampson, which is a fascinating uh, book. It's really, he was the um, official biographer of uh, Nelson Mandela. I used to read this on the train up and down from Perth to Inverness when I worked at the UHI. And it's about the informal exercise of power in Great Britain, power networks. And the same goes for our institutions. There's a lot of informal networks of power in universities and FE colleges. And you need to be aware of that if you're working with EdTech. EdTech uh, cuts across a lot of existing informal power structures. So The Prince by Machiavelli does have a bad rep for being Machiavellian, as they say, but he does make the point that a strategy is nothing without a plan. Now, in our universities particularly, but also in our FE colleges, a great deal of time is spent on developing strategies. Uh, lots of wordsmithing goes into it. Unfortunately, it stops just there. It's then going to magically happen by free will. Well, Machiavelli understood the concept of power. So that strategy is not going to happen unless it's made to happen. And for that to happen, you need a plan. It's called an implementation plan in the business. And then you monitor the implementation plan to see if it's actually happening. So, and then we need to analyze our institutions to, to implement a plan or even to come up with a strategy. John Biggs, The Aligned Curriculum, it's still a radical concept, uh, a great book. Um, it's a simple idea that um, everything should have something to do with the learning outcomes. That's not always the case. And he came up with the Aligned Curriculum concept, which was that exact idea. But for EdTech to function properly, I would say the, the institution needs to be aligned. All the bits of it need to work in synchronicity. And that's simply not the case at the minute. Our, Admin systems are often paper, take, paper, take, backwards and forwards. And also educational technology um, actually makes visible some of these uncomfortable things about our institutions, a process of reification, it's called. Reading and resource lists, um, one of the great neglected opportunities for learning, I argue, if to annotate it and direct learners to the parts of the resources and links to the outcomes, that would be absolutely magic. But often they're just big lists with no clue about what you're supposed to do with them. And that actually disadvantages people who are autistic and non-traditional learners, you know? Okay. Um, EdTech is actually a really political area. So is education in our society but it's remarkable for the dearth of political discourse that happens in EdTech with a few, um, what do you call them? Not examples, exceptions, that's the word. So the trick is not to fall for the Silicon Valley narrative, a happy clappy people kind of narrative, everything's fine. Um, the Battle for Open by Martin Weller is a good book. Uh, and for our demographic and educational technology, I would argue that book by Paul Mason, A Guide to Our Future Post-Capitalism, it does a deep dive into the effects of technology on uh, the way capitalism works. And then there's an oldie one, uh, The Mask of Anarchy by Percy Bysshe Shelley, which you've not come across it before, is a great little read. Right, I'm into the bonus slides now, I'll just skip through these really quickly. Education theory and pedagogical confidence, really important. Uh, theory is important, but it's not the same as pedagogical confidence and design knowledge. Theory can and should inform our pedagogy designs, but it is prone to short-term fashions, learning styles, for instance, but the useful stuff sticks around. So you should be critical and not be intimidated. And it's particularly true for our academic friends. And also beware of celebrity experts and local mini me experts in our institutions who are making a position for themselves on the back of all this. The, the role of EdTech person, public relations and networks of influencers is, is under examined this area. The only one I know that's doing anything on this is a woman in America called Audrey Waters. 
who is uh, a good read in this area. Um, a bit more on theory here. If you've not come across the work of Professor Graham Gibbs, you've really got to check him out. And his 53 ideas that he did for CEDA, the Staff Educational Development Association. I just love this quote. I'll read it out. A good deal of educational literature is dull, impenetrable or useless, or even all three at the same time. Only a small proportion of educational ideas are powerful in that they embody what I would call pedagogic leverage. If you act on them, then something different and worthwhile happens. Much educational theory seems impossible even to act on, let alone likely to produce worthwhile improvements. I know it's contentious, but I love it. Okay, uh, case studies and stripped down ed tech, getting back to the KISS principle. I've talked a little bit about the UHI um, and the London College Outlaws. At one stage, the US Marine Corps were using simple email and Outlook to do um, distance learning in the field. It worked. Um, so really, you need to think about your context to, to choose what the technologies that you're using. One other example of something simple, and that radically simple that worked was uh, a guy at Fife College years ago, way back in the 90s. He had a radical idea of stopping lecturers using their notes and all work from one uh, textbook in um, electrical and electro electronic engineering. It's a tough subject, lots of maths and theory, a lot of dropouts. It had a radical effect. It made the learning experience coherent just by using a textbook. So that, that's an example of a, a simple solution. And finally, the virtues of paper. This is a picture of the United States Navy from 2014. 17,000 officers are doing an exam in one of the world's most technologically advanced organizations. And it looks like they're using pen and paper. They're not at sea, they're in port. So it's just something to think about. If that's what they're doing, and there's some resources there. Right, I will stop sharing my screen. Whew. Hey John, I don't suppose um, <clears throat> of those 13, and thanks for the one extra, I always appreciate the extra. <laughs> I, I just wonder, um, do you have like a, a top tip amongst that 13th that has seen you well through the years? Yeah. Funnily enough, I do. The power of the narrative. When I'm working with an academic and we're trying to convert a course, I guess I should big myself up here. I did some of the first dementia training courses in the UK for carers when I was working at the, the dementia centre at Stirling Uni. And a common problem, and it, it relates to pedagogic confidence. People, academics are often really nervous about taking their first steps into blended or distance learning. This was a distance learning course. And it's understandable because they're working from what they know. Plus there's all this hype and BS surrounding ed tech, which makes people very nervous. So what I say to them is, look, why don't you write a half a page about this course, what it's about, why it's good and stuff like that. That'll get you in the zone and start to use journalistic questions. Who's it for? What's it about? How is it going to happen? Why is it good? Things like that. And often that opens the door. Then they get into the zone of looking at themselves as others see themselves because so much of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis is habitual. It's done semi-unconsciously. That's not a, an insult. It's just the way you work. And when you work using technology, you're in a different place and you need assistance to get to that different place. So that would, and again, that's a very simple thing to do. You just need pen and paper. Never overlook the importance of simple. <laughs> um, I have un, uh, enabled the ability for you to unmute yourselves. So if, if anyone has a question um, for, for John. See, I can't tell whether they're just struggling to unmute themselves and they all have questions for you, John, or or uh, whether or not. Thinking, what is that gobby old git going on about? <laughs> I always enjoy your talks. I, I would, I would, I would literally just happily continue this for the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> I praise indeed. So one of the, one of the things we were discussing uh, earlier is is ultimately how 
how do you attract everyone or to get the best out of what's there? And one of the issues with a lot of staff members is they don't know what's out there and what's good. And, and mm. you, you get flooded by all of these ideas and technology. So do, do you have an approach to filtering out what's good? I think it'll partly depend on who you're dealing with. If you're dealing with someone who's pretty your favorite technology, that's different. So it's contextual. It's a bit like being a doctor. You're treating a different patient each time. Um, so one guy I'm working with at the minute, we're doing a virtual reality project. He's very, very happy with technology. But there's other people who you might be working with who are just starting out and they just need reassurance. Keep, like, keep it simple. They think, for instance, everything should be super glossy. <laughs> right? Um, so they're intimidated by the media hype surrounding all this. So if you say to them, look, why don't you put some stuff online, but keep it simple, it's a reference point. Yes, it might be a bit like an online library, uh, but simple tips like, um, a lot of academics don't know how to use word styles. Yeah, um, now, important for accessibility, especially now. It's very important for accessibility. Um, and it's very important for, I think, general use, maybe autistic people and others. Um, but if you, if you create your learning resource, whatever it is, um, in Word with learning styles, create a table of contents, that's usually a massive breakthrough for a lot of academics. It's like, wow, I can create a table of contents. <laughs> and then if you convert that to a PDF, wow, you can actually read that on a web browser. <laughs> now, the, the sad fact is, in a lot of our VLEs, it, the, it, the content is Word documents and PowerPoints. That's no good to a lot of our students. Um, the pro one of the big problems in FE is a lot of our students don't have a computer at home. Their sole means of access in the internet will be a smartphone. And actually, here's a question I've got for the, the participants today. Um, as far as I'm aware, no institution in Scotland, apart from Edinburgh University, does a routine survey of their students' uh, internet access. Um, is anyone there doing such a survey on a regular basis of what platforms, students are using to access because if students are expected to be doing blended learning outside the college and they've only got a smartphone how are we going to account for that and if we don't even know how many of our students have only got smartphones and what their internet access conditions are that's not very good to put it mildly so i, I would be interested to know if anyone is working in an institution that does that survey. I did see recently, it was in the news, that uh, Fife College were actually out delivering uh, laptops to students that they had identified not having the correct equipment after, this, uh, after they get sent home with the coronavirus. So there might be something there from Fife. I don't know how they went about and actually identified the students that needed it more than most, whether it was ad hoc, but I don't know about any systematic thing that happened before. Yeah. This whole and I think that's that's a very simple point to make. If institutions are not gathering that basic information, how serious are they about using ed tech? They're surveying the hell out of students in every other respect, but in that respect, it doesn't seem to happen. I know that with the Edinburgh surveys, and I, I, I see them every year, so they regularly have as over 98% of students have their own laptop, for example, um, it, pushing 99% uh, sometimes. And, and that far outstrips yeah, FE. So yeah. James had mentioned in the chat that they, they do monitor access via what devices people are accessing the content online with. Um, and I, I believe that there was a question for you as well. Um, as I as I scroll upwards, and it was it was about from Jill. Do you think this sudden situation we're in will have a long term benefit to ed tech and its use in FE or HE, or do you think that people will be more scared since they were thrown into it without warning? 
think it should do. Um, however, I wouldn't underestimate the tendency of inertia in our organisations for things to fall back to way, the way they were. Um, our institutions are primarily face-to-face -face still and paper-based. Uh, yeah, so I would like to think so, but don't underestimate the, the inertia in our institutions. <laughs> hmm. I've got screen sharing going on with uh, James Ritchie and his kitchen. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's not visible to everyone, but it, it's just because James had come on and um, I, I muted his mic. Okay. So, I, I, so I, I also want to apologise for Carolina, um, who I hope I'm pronouncing uh, her name correctly, from Edinburgh College, who was attempting to come in earlier, but I, I was barring her because I, I, I suspected her to be a Zoom bomber. I do apologise. You, you can come twice for the next session. Um, <laughs> so, John, we're, we're just coming up to the end of our 30 minutes. So we, we traditionally uh, do take a pause here where we will stop the recording and everyone is welcome to continue in the room. Um, we will not be having a session tomorrow uh, because of the, uh, the, the holiday uh, and we'll be back next Tuesday. Um, so for anyone watching online, Please stay safe and we hope to see you again next week.